Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Six Customer-Centric Strategies to Maximize Sales and Service Revenue. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by DealerOn. And for anyone who isn't familiar with DealerOn, well, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency, and we're best known for our search engine optimization, best-in-class customer service, and our award-winning websites. At NADA, DealerOn received the Best in Show Award for website design from Dealer Marketing Magazine. DealerOn was named the top-rated website provider by Driving Sales in 2012 and 2013, and it's official. DealerOn customers have been winners of the Digital Dealer Website Excellence Awards, highly coveted overall winner, four times in a row. DealerOn's the only website company that can claim that. We're so committed to lead conversion, optimization, and customer service that we're the only company in the industry to offer a money-back lead guarantee program. So does your website company guarantee you leads? Well, then maybe you should check us out at DealerOn.com. And we have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have Bill Wittenmeyer as our presenter today. Bill Wittenmeyer currently serves as a partner of eLead1, the leading automotive CRM and marketing provider in the industry and a division of Data Software Services, LLC. In addition to the daily responsibilities of the sales division, Bill also handles all OEM relationships for the company and key accounts, such as Auto Vitel. Prior to joining eLead1 in 2002, Bill spent over 10 years in the automotive retail space, holding various positions in retail operations management with organizations such as the Coggin Automotive Group, a Florida-based Asbury automotive platform. Bill Wittenmeyer is currently active in several prominent automotive forums. He speaks at a whole lot of venues each year and was a finalist as a representative of eLead1 for the American Honda Premier Partner Award. Bill can be reached at billw at eleadcrm.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, don't worry, we'll respond by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of the webinar recording is also going to be emailed to you later today for your reference, and please feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. And I also wanted to let you know that DealerOn is going to be at the upcoming Digital Dealer Convention in Las Vegas. It's going to be at the Mirage, October 15, 16, and 17. We're going to be at booth 809. And we have some absolutely astounding presenters for DealerOn during this year's DDC Fall Conference. Here are a few for your consideration. Of note, we will be hosting a live webinar with Grant Cardone from the DealerOn booth at the Digital Dealer Convention Exhibit Hall floor on Wednesday, October 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 4 no, that's backwards, 1 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. No, that's backwards, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. <laughs> God, I hope you guys got that right because I want you to put it in your calendars. 4 p.m. Eastern, Wednesday, October 16th is what's going to be our webinar next week. You don't want to miss it. And for more information or to get your tickets, go check out digitaldealerconference.com. And also, eLead1 will also be at the 15th Digital Dealer Convention in Las Vegas next week. They are going to be at booth 610. So if you're going to be there, you're definitely going to want to stop by for your chance to win an iPad Mini. So don't miss it. Booth 610, eLead1. You definitely want to do that. And guess what? Our good friends at eLead1, they're giving away a fantastic prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning a free 500 name gold digger call campaign. It's valued at $1,750. This gold digger live call campaign blends best in class e-lead virtual BDC with the industry's most advanced data mining technology to strategically target, target positive equity or early trade out opportunities. But you have to be on the live broadcast to win it though. Just stay tuned for the details after Bill's presentation and you could be scoring this awesome prize today for your dealership. And at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to receive a short survey. So fill it out because we're always looking for great feedback from our audience. And today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to also win some Google prizes. So we're going to have some fun. Let's get started. Let's learn how six customer-centric strategies are going to maximize our sales and service revenue. Bill Wittenmeyer, how are you, my friend? Thank you, Ileana. It's so hard to uh, always follow you because you're so smooth and so eloquent. So I'm, it'll be downhill from here, so I'm going to apologize up front. 
but uh, thank everybody for joining us today. And hopefully we'll get a little bit more than six things out of here. And let's look at today's objectives uh, to jump right into it. You know, intelligently track customers through the shopping phase. Um, this used to be a really simple, straightforward thing, but it lacked intelligence. You know, our customers were well armed when they came in with info, uh, and we had no clue. They either came in on the lot or they called, but then the digital leads and e-commerce started to take off, and it was a whole new insight. Uh, but what do we do? What do we do now when it comes to those items? Unmatched results and generation of appointments, leads, and follow-ups. Now with enhanced technology process, we can effectively be well informed of their intentions, desires, and key points. We can then interject that into our sales methods, and this can dramatically increase our opportunities for appointments, additional leads, and more intelligent follow-up. And then finally, smarter communication with new and existing opportunities. You know, in my opinion, this changes the entire way we look at the steps to the sale. Uh, and it puts it in our favor as salespeople. So those would be the major discussion points. And then, of course, at the end, we'll uh, open it up for a little question and answer session and go from there. So let's look at how do customers and opportunities get into our dealerships? How do they arrive? You know, we all know now that it's greater than 80% chance that they probably shopped and researched online somewhere in the process. It's probably greater than 90% once they've been into our store. Heck, I would tell you that they're probably shopping you while you're there and you went to go get the keys for the demo, either looking at their iPad or on the phone, et cetera. Back in the day, we'd sit there, and not too long ago, and maybe even for some dealers that are still out there, probably nobody that's on this phone, it was a guessing game. It was based on assumptions. How did they come in? What dropped them in? What drove them? You know, if you used a good training method from some of the great trainers out there, you probably started with lots of questions to gather info. What brought you in today? Did you hear about our sale? You know, what info can I assist you with in your shopping process? Or the best one that my manager told me, which is something like this, are you going to buy or fly today, sir? That was always a good one. Now, with the proper support and technology, we can determine not only where they came from, but specific sites, pages visited, even info they looked at, search words used, et cetera. We're now armed with an immense amount of information prior to the customer even walking in the door. And some of those dealers that are taking that to another level will start to Google their customers before they come in. And you know, not in a creepy way, but hey, look at Facebook, let's see what's out there, what are they interested in? You know, all those old steps to the sale still apply that if you can find that common ground and you can find those opportunities that you can talk about, you can put the conversation into the sale and eventually that will lead to a lot more opportunities and making that bond in the rapport. The great part is, this has really changed the way the buying experience has been, and certainly from an execution standpoint. You know, if we look at a large dealer group case study that was just recently done at the beginning of this year, we can see that massive higher follow-up rates, higher demos performed, and a lot more interaction with key managers. And these are really critical factors. A few years ago, you would never see demo drives in the 80s and 90s percent. You would never see introduction to managers in the 70s. A few years ago, an average number would be half of that. And you would feel good if you were at 50%. So I think based on that information and some execution inside dealerships, we're able to actually increase the buying experience as it relates to our customers and how they feel. And Ileana, it looks like we've got our first question uh, for the poll group, if you want to throw that out there. Perfect. Bill, thank you so much. Sit back and relax while I ask the audience this question. Audience, we want to know, nationally, what percentage of e-commerce leads or internet leads have a valid phone number? We want to know what you think. Please select one of the following options. Do you think it's 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, or do you think 70% of all internet leads have a valid phone number? I'm, I'm a little bit shocked that we didn't actually put in there 80 or 90%. Are you telling me people lie about their phone number? <laughs> it's not a loaded question. We got people writing in saying, asking if it's a loaded question. I swear it's not a loaded question. We want to know. There is, somebody actually did a study and they found out how many internet leads have a valid phone number. 
What do you think it is? So we get lots of votes coming in. Audience, thank you so much for participating in our poll questions. And um, once I get a majority of the votes, actually we already have a majority of votes, almost everyone's voted actually, we're going to close this poll, share the results, and then Bill's going to tell us what the right answer is. <laughs> here we go. Are you ready, Bill? Fire away. Okay, here we go. We're going to close this poll and share the results. Okay, going in order. 22% of today's audience said it was only 30%. 28% of today's audience think it's more like 40%. 7% of today's audience said it was 50%. Another 28% said it was 60%. And then we got 15% of today's audience think it's as high as 70%. So, Bill, what is the correct answer? What percentage of Internet leads have a valid phone number? Well, this is always a great question that stirs up thought and debate, which is why I thought it would be good for this discussion. Now, the answer I will give you in one second is going to be based off of research on hundreds of thousands of Internet leads over the last year that we've actually made live phone calls to. And the shocking number is over 70% of Internet leads currently today have a valid phone number on them. In fact, the exact number in our poll was 73% have a valid number, which I think is a really key thing. We find that a lot of people typically come back and say, hey, look, you know, they want to talk to you over the Internet. That's why they submitted the lead. But the really interesting thing is that three-quarters of them actually give you a valid phone number to talk about. And I think that's a great thing to take a look at as we go forward. That's actually higher than I would have suspected, but that's great news for dealers. It really is great news for dealers. We actually have a question from the audience. Joe wrote in, where does that number come from? Could you explain again where you got that? That's from how many phone calls that you did research on? Yeah, a absolutely, and it's a great question, I think, to provide validity to it. We typically will receive into our automotive-only call center approximately 100,000 to 200,000 Internet e-commerce leads every month, of which we make a live phone call to. And so based off of the last year's results, so that would be over a million calls just to Internet leads only, over 73% of them actually had a valid phone number where that customer is at. Great question. Did you say over a million? Uh, over a million so far this year, so a pretty good sampling size, and that would be in every state in, the, in, the, in our beautiful country, so all the way out to Hawaii, Alaska, and everywhere in between. Holy moly. Okay, please, go ahead. So here's the great part. We ended on the last one about we talked about some of the great opportunities in the buying experience and how that's increased in execution. But the other thing is it's also presented more challenges. Is there are now more items that are critical to execute. You know, if we look at these two items here between phone and email performance and work plan performance, what we have to do now is we have to critically execute and get multiple numbers to collect, and we have to get emails. It's more than just getting that first step or that first phone number. So I think we've seen a really great increase from the dealership perspective in getting at least initial information. But I think now it's really key to get those deeper dives, whether it's a second phone number or even more critical, a valid email address on those that haven't come in from an Internet lead. And I'm going to throw out an action idea here because in a lot of these areas when it starts uh, getting discussed about collecting information or when we up a customer or et cetera, the idea of a driver's license scanner comes up. And the technology nowadays is really great. You can use a snap shell. It's instantaneous. It's just like when you go rent a, a vehicle. And I think most vendors and CRM companies all out there provide that. I'm going to steer you in a totally different way, and I'm going to tell you to stay away from it altogether. And here's my reasoning. It misses the most key information possible, and that's two things. It misses a phone number, and it misses an email. You will never find that on any driver's license in the country. So I think, again, that only puts us back to that first step, which I think most dealers do a great job of it already. So we look at sales as a numbers game, and we know that CRM kind of fuels that game. But what does that mean? I think that means that you have to look at a couple of key points. Number one, short and long-term key predictive indicators. Don't look at, log look at logging percentage. Don't look at closing percentage. People manage to expectation. They will log as much as they think will keep them in that, that sweet spot of a closing percentage so they don't keep 
beat down. So I say raise the bar. Tie logging to bonuses that are already existing. Focus on additional logged info, such as getting an email, such as getting a second phone number, or even a third phone number. You know, nowadays people have a work, a cell, and a home, so there's three opportunities there for us. So I think we have to fill in and fill that pipe so we can increase our numbers and use key predictive indicators to manage that on a daily basis. Second thing, maybe the most key point, a CRM champion inside the store. Look, I'm going to try to stir up some controversy. Multitasking is a lie. Multitaskers are not talented. We are merely ADD, or we have less patience and concentration. And I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> when you do multitasking, all you're doing is several things poorly, not one thing great. So take one person as your CRM or info champion, assign it as one, and have them do a great job. Second thing, when, or third thing, when they're doing that great job, have them manage the activities, not results. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you, I am impossible to manage. I think most people are impossible to manage because we all have different personalities. We all have different agendas and desires and things that are, are key to us. But look, tasks, they can be managed, and they have to be managed on a daily basis. Use those key predictive indicators. Use effective reporting for tracking. Just don't get paralysis by analysis. Look at individual things and make sure that they're doing them on a daily basis. Do that on the 10th of the month. Don't do it on the 30th. That would be a very key thing. Improve the professional sales culture. Look, if you're doing those previous things, now you have an opportunity to increase professional sales culture. But how do you do that? I think this is the biggest lacking area that we have inside dealerships nowadays, and that's coaching and counseling. Everybody can point out problems, but how do we coach them, how do we counsel them, and how do we get those additional ideas so that we increase what we do? Use the KPI to show you those deficiencies, as I mentioned on the 10th, versus a deficient sales on the 30th. You can't change somebody's month on the 30th. But on the 10th, when you notice that they're tracking for only 20 people logged for the month or they only have five emails, you can make a difference with two-thirds of the month left, and that will allow you to increase the numbers and the activity, and that's a key piece. Finally, that creates that center of excellence. You know, not just promised on your website about how great your dealership is, but an actual execution with the people that you have around you and gathering that information. That has led to something what I think is the most key fundamental that everybody already knows. This is the most obvious, the transformation of mobile. But I think it goes in a totally different direction. And hear what I mean. I think we can absolutely increase the amount of fresh opportunities that we see. We're already seeing from a dealership level that there's a rise in the fresh opportunities log because it's easier, it's more available with your phone or a mobile device, iPad, et cetera or the applications and CRMs that can promote this. But I think what's really key is that we can get better customer information. You know, not only are salespeople logging more because it's easier, but it's better to get better information. You can get those second numbers and those email addresses. You should be able to enter this info quickly, easily, and directly into your CRM during a conversation literally out on the lot with the customer in your daily process. If you look at anybody right now, they're constantly on their phone, constantly texting, Facebooking, et cetera. You can take those extra two seconds with the consumer and the prospect right there or anywhere, as I'm going to talk about in a second, and get that information in quickly and easily. That's what leads us into what I call the sales professional transformation. I think that there is a major cultural transformation happening. Now when we're logging those, those those prospects and we're gathering that info, it's not just at the dealership environment anymore. And here's where people can really go to another level. Jackie Cooper and some of those old trainers from 20 and 30 years ago used to talk about gathering info from people they were doing business with, whether it was their person at the laundromat, whether now it would be at Starbucks. We're seeing an evolution of automotive professionals that are finding and logging new prospects everywhere they're at, whether it's at Starbucks when they tip a good service person, when they go out to eat, their kids' games, gathering, all the places that they do business. Look, people love to talk about the car business. I give this example constantly. I get on airplanes, typically on Friday after traveling all week. I'm tired. I'm really fortunate. I have so many miles that they usually put me up in first class, even though we buy the cheapest tickets possible, I assure you. 
what I find up happening is two things. Number one, they usually ask to see my ticket to see if I'm supposed to be up there because my hair is all long or they see tattoos, I'm not in a suit, et cetera. The second thing that happens is I sit down next to somebody who's inevitably a little bit older than I am, and they always ask me one thing, which is, what do you do for a living? I used to make the mistake that I told them I was in the car business. Not a mistake because I wasn't proud, a mistake because it's a five-hour flight from Atlanta back to Los Angeles, and for four hours and 45 minutes, all I would hear about is the greatest car deal they ever got, the worst car deal they ever got, what is their trade worth, what is the deal out there. My point, I think you get. People love to talk about the car business, and they feel much more comfortable talking about the car business outside of the dealership environment, and I think that's where you can find a lot of great opportunities and start increasing that. And I think mobile gives you that ability to do it seamlessly and very easy. That finally, not only is it improved for culture, but communication. This has allowed us to, once that we get those additional opportunities and we've gathered additional methods to contact them, now you can start texting. Do what people do on a daily basis. Some of the greatest investment advice I ever got was buy what people buy, buy what you buy. If you drink a lot of Coke, maybe you should go invest in Coca-Cola. It's a solid company. The same thing applies for communication. Communicate with people the same way you communicate with people. So gather that information and be able to learn how to effectively communicate with those prospects, but you've got to be able to gather it first. Now you can be first to market. When that car comes in or the new incentives are announced, you can text the customers that you've been communicating with instantaneously. You can email them. You can call them. You will know and have those additional prospects. That's the really key thing. So. Now, looks like, Ileana, you get another poll question. Fire away. All right, audience, you heard the man. I'm going to put this poll question up here, and we want to know what you think. So, the question is, on average, how many phone dialing attempts does it take to make contact with a customer? Please select one of the following answers. In your opinion, do you think it is two attempts, three attempts, four attempts, five attempts, or is it an exhausting six attempts? Whatever the answer is in your world, we want to know. So once we get a majority of the votes, we'll close the poll and share the results. I have to say, Bill, you must pick some pretty good questions because these people are voting crazy fast. This is awesome. Thank you so much, audience, for getting involved. This is going to be a fun question. And I'm assuming, Bill, that you have this answer. <laughs> I do have this answer. You have this answer. OK, just making sure. <laughs> Okay, um, and before I close the poll, and so I'll give you another couple seconds to vote, we had a very interesting comment that came in from Joe, and he says, I think the amount depends on what time of day that you try to contact them. So, Bill, I'm going to let you comment on that in just a second. Let me close this poll and share the results with you. Are you ready, Bill? Fire away. Okay, so only 9% of today's audience thinks that it would take as little as two attempts to make contact with a customer. But an overwhelming majority, 42% of today's audience, said it's more like three. Three is the magic number for them. Three attempts to get in touch with a customer. A quarter of today's audience, 25%, said four attempts is what it takes for them. Only 5% said it would take five attempts. And 18% of today's audience said it would take six attempts. That's a lot of attempts. So, Bill, my question to you is, what's the right answer on average, nationally, I assume? And then also, does it depend on what time of day you try and contact them? Well, a couple of questions there. First, I will tell you there is no right answer. The right answer ends up being whatever works for you. However, <laughs> I, will give you, I will give you what our experience is and what we base this poll question on. Again, looking at 10 million dials to automotive customers over the last uh, 12 months, all the way from unsold showrooms to internet leads, et cetera. Here's the number that we found. It is slightly over five attempts to get a consistent contact rate of over 70%. So we look at that as having to take at least five attempts to get the majority of the people live on the phone. So. There are obviously attempts that happen earlier. You will get a percentage earlier in the process. But if we look at the average of all 10 million of those dials, it takes five attempts to get a customer on the phone wow. from that environment. Wow, that was not, 
I thought that that was really, really high when I heard that you put five or six on there. But so five is the average. Yeah, and the great news is you can tell that the audience has absolutely been involved and in, through the evolution of the process. Because I will tell you, as little as two years ago, you would easily have the majority of people say that they would get them on the first or the second attempt. Now. I have to clarify that. Most of those people probably thought that leaving a really strong voicemail like, hey, it's Bill at ABC Motors, call me, I got great news, qualifies as a contact, which it doesn't. We mean live contact with the customer. So kudos to the audience for being much more in touch than some of the people a few years ago. Now, the other question back to Joe, briefly, I will tell you, great question. Um, number one, it is absolutely critical about the time of day and when you do that and the difference. And it's a great segment in, so thank you so much. Uh, maybe I sent you this uh, presentation before because you led me right into uh, what I wanted to talk about next. So great question. Let's talk about that a little bit. So you talk about building an effective BDC. And I mean inside your own store. It probably sounds probably odd coming from a company that really has a large footprint from automotive call centers and virtual BDCs, but we think you can build an effective one inside your store, and any good vendor should be able to help you and support you with that. The first thing I'll tell you, got to be friendly, it's got to be flexible, it's got to be fun. Here's what's really interesting. You've got to make this an area that represents this, not a sales jail. You can't force people to go up there for two hours a day and they feel like they're bogged down and it's not something that they want to do. Half the time, the BDC is tucked away in a back closet. It's upstairs. It's the last use space inside the store. I even saw one at one time that was in an attic over a service department. You could barely hear anything from the lifts that were going all day long. Look. You've got to make this a focal point of the store if you're going to do it, a bright, welcoming area, and you've got to create the environment. Now, what do you do along with that? Use it to focus on ways to get data from customers that may have already been missed earlier in the sales process. Don't make this a BFC, which is a business follow-up center, which I think most are. Turn it into a true business data center or a business development center. Use a survey approach. There is only one bad feedback, and that is no feedback. In other words, I'll take any feedback, positive or negative, that allows me to do something with. But if I get no feedback, I can do nothing with that. So try a survey approach as opposed to calling them up with some script about trying to bring them back into the dealership for some special, et cetera. It's a little different from conventional thinking, but I think it opens up for more conversation and more info. Make sure, and here you go, Joe, make sure that you staff efficiently and at the right times. See, the problem is we try to staff the same time we bring people in in the dealership in the morning, 9, 10, 11, first shifts come on. Look, most people are at work at that point. You're not going to get them on the phone. It's much better to try in the afternoons and the evening. Staff efficiently around those times that work in your area or your culture. That's a very important thing. Be able to track those outbound calls. Be able to see how long time people were on the phone for, number of dials they made, the connections, and most importantly, the comments. A good CRM should be able, and any technology that you're using should be able to allow you to track that, keep that, and then effectively go back and look at that so you can make adjustments on it. So again, be that BDC in a data and a development versus that BFC. So how do you turn it from data into development, as I was talking about a little bit earlier in the BDC? This is what you can look at. Let's look at some ideas that can make it that development set. Turn your data into dollars. The perfect prospect. A lot of different ideas about this. We look at the perfect prospect not just as database mining from a sales perspective, which is the most popular and wide range over the last couple of years. But we look at it as converting service customers into sales customers. A good CRM should allow you instant access, alerts, et cetera, to service customers coming in today or even right now that are in equity positions. Or better yet, it can even identify the cars they can move into in your inventory right now, giving you that information to go back and to see them in the service lane. Some dealerships have even developed actual departments that are specifically around one person that that's all they do on a daily basis. Target the right person at the right time. Look, we get that. We think there 
all the right customers, especially if they're in service. They, number one, like you. They trust you. They're spending money with you. And even more importantly, they're back there. They're at your dealership right now. I would much rather have an opportunity that's face-to-face -face with me inside of my dealership than trying to get somebody on the phone or sending them some great email about how wonderful we are and we're going to give them the lowest price in the world. This case, I've got them right there in front of me. I've got those tools. I can quickly show them somewhere else to go and to move into a new vehicle. Everybody wants to be in a new car. They just don't think they can afford it or that it's going to fit their budget. A good system will allow you to do that instantaneously. I think what else is key is this. You don't have to establish this giant process to do this. It's a lot of work, and it takes additional people. But you could certainly print out an offer sheet to buy their vehicle and have that vehicle figure for them laying on the passenger seat on every car that goes through your service lane right now. This could literally increase the amount of opportunities in any given store from anywhere from 500 to 1,000 opportunities each additional month that's untapped just by doing that, printing out that offer sheet, putting it on the passenger seat, allowing them to drive off, maybe even a handwritten note that says, hey, call me, I was interested. Great action idea. Maybe even an offer sheet with multiple offers to trade that vehicle. Next up, OEM programs and incentives. Look, if you have a BDC, if you've got that opportunity, you certainly have the data. Be the first to market using database mining tools in your CRM and your technology. As soon as those incentives hit, identify those customers, but use small lists. I highly recommend that you go with smaller lists. They have higher appointment ratios and certainly higher than traditional marketing methods. These customers are much higher in value, so don't waste the opportunities by doing some giant list, handing it out to a bunch of group, and trying to carpet bomb your customers. Start small and maximize that. How do you do that? Outbound call campaigns. And I'm not pitching a virtual BDC. I'm saying to do it inside your store. Get your managers involved in calling these, these, these customers. If you're a manager, get involved. A good partner vendor will supply you with the scripting that allows you to walk through this and do this on your own. Here's another action idea. Get F&I managers involved. We talked earlier about the BDC. Maybe you don't have one. Maybe you could make one for the day. Making a BDC doesn't have to be a long-term commitment. You could literally do one for the day on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. Grab the F&I managers in the morning. Typically, they're not that busy at that point unless they're a director. Not a lot of deals are closing then. It gets busier in the afternoon. They're sometimes the strongest closers in the dealership. At least they think so. Go ask them. And they can get on the phone, and they can handle a lot of great objectives. So get them involved in the process. That's a great action idea to take forward. Now, look at a campaign. This is a large campaign uh, on a big scale, but at the end of the day, it works the same and the percentages are the same on a single store level. It's always about your data and it's about the execution. I'm going to point out a really key thing here. You can realize a 7 to 10% sales opportunity at any given time with your data using proper database methods. And that's how you start to get customers for life. And I think that's a really key factor. So everybody's aware of the pipeline or the customer pipeline. I just don't think we always concentrate or we divide the proper time and effort to the right areas. I recommend more times towards the top working down. In other words, you will naturally work hard and spend time with the bottom half of this example, the clients and the sales leads that have been nurtured further down the pipe. That's going to happen. It's like working hard on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday or doing advertising in the dealership for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Look, that takes care of itself. You're already going to have a big weekend. Work on the days earlier in the week, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Same process when it comes to your pipeline. Work for, towards the top on gathering more leads, finding more prospects, and then concentrating on the follow-up of those prospects. That is a huge area I think people can do instantaneously, whether it's lead generation, key metrics that we talked about earlier, the accountability of having that one person, not multitasking, converting those into sales, and then, of course, follow-up and then the art of the referral, which I think most people have lost at this point. I will give you another action item 
that I don't think anybody does, and it's very powerful, and here's what it is. If you're the greatest closer in the world, you close 30% of the people you talk to, 70% are not buying from you. I guarantee you a large percentage of those people are buying from somebody else. Maybe it's not your fault. Maybe it was Captain Lowball in the used car department. Maybe it was just you didn't have the right vehicle. I follow up on the people that buy somewhere else constantly when it's another product. I thank them for the opportunity, and then I put them into my follow-up routine. You can do this exact same thing when it comes to selling cars. Somebody that bought somebody else rarely gets followed up with by the dealership after they get the thank you, please score me well on a CSI. Take over the follow-up on that sold. More than likely, they bought something that is very similar to what you were trying to sell, and eventually, guess what? They either know somebody or they're going to buy another car again. I bet you some of those people even start to think that they bought the car from you because you're doing the follow-up. Just because somebody buys a car somewhere else does not mean that's not another opportunity. So let's look at some takeaways here. Intelligent market focus metrics improving the understanding of our customers and shopping phase. Look, technology has allowed us to see more clearly the customer paths to us, whether it was on specific pages, inventory, et cetera. Let's use that as our benefit, and let's turn the tide on how customers shop with us. They do that once, twice, maybe a couple of times every three years. We do it on a daily basis. Let's use it to our advantage. Using mobile technology to optimize that communication. We talked earlier about mobile technology increasing our opportunity. Use it to gather, create, communicate with prospects in new ways and in new places. Get outside of the dealership environment, which is where you spend half your life, and start finding those other opportunities, whether it's at a great restaurant, you find good service, tip them, Hi, then make sure you get some information from Starbucks, wherever you do business. If you're going to pick up laundry, you've earned the right for that because they're going to buy a car somewhere. You're doing business with them. Find those great places of reciprocation. Effective BDC generation for more leads and appointments. Look, you can make a BDC for the day. Make it friendly. Make it fun. Make it a true development center, not a follow-up center. Get with your partners, which are your vendors. Have them provide you scripts. If they won't call us, I'd be glad to give you as many scripts as you need and to help you out from your own level and to make sure that it happens there. Just make sure it's not a follow-up center. And remember that key ingredient, which is this survey. Come at it from a different approach. I think once we start developing those things, then we come back to the centers of excellence. Now we can come and we can continue on the promise of our website, such as we're easy to do business with, our customers love us. In other words, let's execute on the items that we spoke about today. Create your own economy. Max the customer lifetime value. And let's not disappoint them on their experience when they come in from our promises. Let's exceed their expectations. And let's exceed our work ethics, and we can find a lot more deals. Ileana, thank you so very much. All of those that are on there today, a lot of people, attendees, thank you so very much. Really appreciate you investing your time with us today. I think, Ileana, you probably want to do some question and answer. Yeah. Bill, we have been getting uh, a lot of people writing in about your awesome ideas that you handed out just now. That was you're just you're not just a pretty face are you bill thank you so much <laughs> okay audience whether you know it or not we have a new feature on here which is the webcam feature that just started a couple of weeks ago so bill is taking full advantage of it so when we are doing our question answers from your audience you're actually going to be able to see bill as he answers the questions and bill fantastic presentation and yes audience if you have questions for bill now's a great time to write them in we already have some really wonderful questions that we're going to ask Bill in just a second. But before we do that, we have a little bit of business to take care of. So it's that time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, I announced that our good friends at eLead1 are giving away a fantastic prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning a free 500-name Gold Digger call campaign. It's valued at $1,750. The Gold Digger Live Call Campaign, it blends best-in-class E-Lead virtual BDC with the industry's most advanced data mining technology to strategically target positive equity or early trade-out opportunities. Now, you're definitely going to want to win this for your dealership. All you have to do is answer a simple question about today's presentation. 
and the first one to write in the correct response is going to win this awesome prize today. So, get to your keyboards, get ready. Good luck, everyone. I got to tell you, this is not an easy question. I don't think it's an easy question. So, I'm, I'm hoping somebody's going to get this early. This is not an easy question. The question is, what is the sales opportunity percentage on a large scale data mining campaign? What is the sales opportunity percentage on a large scale data mining campaign? If anyone knows the correct answer, please write in and let me know. And I don't see a correct answer yet. I see somebody who's close, but I don't see a correct answer yet. So, Bill, I'm going to ask you, can I take somebody who's close? <laughs> Does close count in horseshoes or in grenades? That's the biggest thing. And the answer is yes. It, it goes to both. So let's see. Okay. Then let me, let me scroll back up here because we got a lot of answers in, but no one had the exact right answer. But we have somebody who's close. So I'm going to take the first closest answer, which goes to Michael Groves. Michael Groves, you are our winner today. No, you lucky guy. Michael Groves, he's he can't count. Twin Cities Automotive Group. Big shout out to the Twin Cities Automotive Group. Fantastic group of stores. Uh, and uh, be sure to see Michael Groves at Driving Sales if you get a chance. Michael, you're not allowed to answer these questions. Come on, man. You're, you're too smart. You're way ahead of the game. Well, the answer that I was supplied with was the sales opportunities percentage on a large-scale data mining campaign is somewhere between 7 and 10 percent. And Michael smart as he is, he answered 10%. He was the closest there one. So, Michael, Excellent congratulations. Job. Usually I ask, what dealership are you from? But but uh, Bill already knows, so thank you so much for playing along, everyone. Nice job. We really appreciate it. And now we are going to get to those questions. So, of course, before we get to that, I want to say congratulations to Michael, today's winner. And, of course, we want to thank E-Lead One for their incredible generosity. That's a fantastic prize that you won today. Okay. First question comes to us, Bill, from Amity. Oh, no, no, Bill. You have to put it on the one with your contact information. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of seeing too many of my faces here, so I know if I am, everybody else does. <laughs> no, no, no. You're cute. It's okay. Okay, Amity wants to know, is there any data on how many times prospects respond to phone follow-up on the valid phone numbers provided? Well, if I interpret that correctly, and, and we say responses, I look at that as connections, and what we determine that is, is they actually allow us to have a complete survey. So not only do they answer the phone, but they actually walk through uh, and will allow you to do whatever the survey or the pitch or the informational piece is. And I think here's a very interesting uh, statistic, and that is this. Less than 2% of the people that we actually get a hold of will reject the call. In other words, they get into the call and they say, no, we're not interested. So if you've got a 70% contact rate, you're looking at a majority of those customers will absolutely talk to you. Now, that might be the, the power of the third party aspect, so you may find a different experience from the store level. Um, but I think with the, right, with the right scripting and the right approach, you should have an extremely high uh, success rate when it comes to that openness. Again, I think most customers really want to talk about the car business. They just get a little leery when it comes directly from the dealership, if not approached the right way. So I don't know if that was the right uh, angle where that question was coming from, but I can certainly clar clarify in another way. Thank you so much, Bill and Amity. I hope that helps you out. Certainly, if you have a follow-up question, don't be shy. Right on in. Our next question comes to us from David. David says, what are some ways you can get your salespeople to do this contacting outside of the dealership? How do we break the, quote, I work when I'm at work, but now I'm on mm. my own time, unquote, attitude. Do you have any advice for David, Bill? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, you know, it's always trying to get people to make this uh, a career. And this could be a really long answer, and I'll try not to be. First of all, we have to understand that most people are always trying this business out, right? They fell into it. They were looking for something else. So we've got to change that culture that this is a career, and that can happen from the dealership side. But more 
specifically to your question, I think it ties back to the number of people log. First, you have to give them the idea. I don't think most people go out and do the things that we used to do a few years ago, reading the books with Jack, Jackie Cooper and looking at those alternative ways, such as now going to Starbucks, logging in, uh, being able to use your mobile app to log customers. I think people have to put themselves out to the universe in order to get things back. So here's my simple answer. Number one, we have to give them the idea. Hey, put yourself out there. It's okay to talk about the car business. Everybody's buying a car. Let people know where you're at. Never assume that they know what you do or what dealership that you're at just because you're wearing an ABC Motors shirt or you've got a name tag. So put yourself out into the universe, number one outside of the environment. Number two, how to make them work when they don't think they're working, because we should always be working. I think you have to tie it back to those logging parameters. And don't add an existing bonus for it. I made those mistakes. I think you tie it into existing bonuses that are there and use it as a qualifier. You know, start off with 50 people that are fresh up log for the month. If you do that, you qualify for any of the volume or the uh, gross bonuses. And you'll be able to continue to raise that up, because they may come to you and say, well, you need, you're not driving any more traffic to the store. No, but you're also spending half of your life outside of the store. When you ask me to go see your kid's game, go grab somebody there. So it takes a little bit of effort. It takes some initiative. At the end of the day, I think you have to tie it to money at some point. A lot of us are money motivated. So give them the idea and then tie it to bonus in some fashion. So great question, David. Thank you. David, that was a great question and a great answer, Bill. So thank you very much. And by the way, David wrote in, he said, excellent answer. So there you go. All right. Thank Thanks. you so much. Bill, keep it up. we got some really good questions. Our next great question comes to us from Adil. He says, how long after should you contact the customer for that survey style call? For example, after we sold a call to a customer. After we sold a car to a customer, do you think it would be a good idea for the BDC manager to contact the customer a day or two later to do a phone survey about their experience, or should we just send a survey questionnaire through the email, et cetera? Mm. So it's like a twofer, because um, it's like, how do you do it? Twofer. How do you do it, and how long sure. should you wait? You know, there, I don't think there's any necessarily right answer for how long you should wait. Again, it goes back to what works for you. I will tell you it's our experience that I think you need to do it in a relatively short period of time. That doesn't necessarily mean in two or three hours after they just left your store, but I think certainly no longer than the next day. I think if you start waiting too much longer than that, look, they're going to have a line of other dealers that they've already talked to that are trying to leave them messages and, and going the old-fashioned way. So, you know, maybe look at 24 hours. If your environment and your culture is a little bit different, you could maybe go to 48 hours, uh, but I wouldn't go any longer than that. Now, I think it's a great question on the two-pronged approach, and I use this even with our own sales team and internally. I think we should do everything in a multi-level. My recommendation is I would try the phone call first and several attempts in that 24 to 48 hour. Then I would go to the email survey. I think that's really key. Let's try to get them on the phone first. Then if you don't succeed there, let's send the email. A lot of people go the other way around and they send the email first. I think that sends a warning signal to the customer just to avoid you. So I would go with the phone call first a couple of times from the survey aspect and then create a great method, hopefully through a solid CRM that can even do that automatically and send that out uh, as a survey to the customers. And again, the real critical point on both of those, I can't handle this home enough, Make it a survey style, not what can I do to earn your business, but how was your experience? Learn about what their experience was and use that feedback. So that would be my answer. I love the name a deal. That's great. I mean, you might as well change the spelling of that to a deal on your business card. I mean, people would remember you forever. <laughs> a deal. If you haven't done that yet, I don't know what you're waiting for, really. That's a good no, idea. Man, I'm telling you. If you can't get a deal from a deal, then what are you doing? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> okay, and we are talking about... Uh, surveying these customers after the sale of a car, correct, Bill? Not just after they yeah, leave. I, you know, I, would, 
I would do it, um, look, everybody does it on the sale of a car, and, and I think that's also good information. But, you know, Ileana, I would really focus, again, earlier in that uh, prospect funnel that we were looking at, and I'd look at every single prospect as being somebody that gets surveyed, and particularly people that come into the dealership. I mean, that's where you want to get that feedback on what really happened. You know, we're not always necessarily very transparent when we don't do a good job with a customer. I can tell you, I know never was. I'm still not. If I don't do a good job with the customer, the last thing I'm going to do is go report to the other partners and say, hey, boy, I really jacked that deal up. Right? I mean, nobody does that. So I think we need, to, we need to focus on early on in the process and those new prospects, and particularly the ones that had some kind of experience with us, whether it be on the phone, whether it be via the internet, and, and obviously inside the showroom. So that was a long explanation to tell you, look, focus earlier in that prospect stream Survey those people that you didn't get bought from. That's the most important. I know I did a good job on the ones that bought from us, at least in some fashion, whether it was price, service, or, or something else. I don't know what happened on the other ones. Do the survey on the other prospects. Agreed. I, you know what, and I don't think enough dealerships are doing the survey at all, even even to the ones that they think are, are the good, you know, happy customers. It's certainly certainly not on unsold. You know, I think everybody has some type of process somewhere along the lines for CSI, whether their, their manufacturer has mandated that or the dealership's mandated that. But, you know, I think it's much more critical to find out from the people that haven't bought from me yet what their experience is. Again, earlier I said, you know, the worst kind of feedback is no feedback. So give me feedback, and that allows me to at least modify and evaluate. And if I decide to make a change, then great. But at least I have valid information to do that from. Yeah, you know, we have a handful of people who are writing in saying that they only do the survey after a sale. They're not doing it at any other point. So I think you've opened some yeah. eyes here today on that one, Bill. Thank you so much. Adil, great question. And uh, we're going to move on to the next question, which comes to us from Evan. Evan says, any best practices on customer satisfaction, advisor selling processes, in service, vehicle assessments, and or how to improve selling technician hours. He's got a lot of questions for you. He has another follow-up question a, after that, too. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of great questions. So, you know, we didn't focus service um, in this particular in terms of those items, but I think those are great questions. So let me try to answer this way. Um, I think that, number one, back to the multitasking, I think there are most things that you have to take out of a service advisor's hands. They're great people, uh, but traditionally, they're just like salespeople on the front. Now, if you ask them that, they would totally deny it. They, t they think they're completely different. But the reality is the only difference is they get their ups from a different part of the dealership. They're very busy. They're trying to do active deliveries. They're trying to do upsell. I mean, try to call into most dealerships to even set a service appointment. I just talked about this on CBT News that will be coming up soon, and we focused on this area. It could take you two or three phone calls into a service department just to set an appointment. So answering a couple of different things. Number one, always tie in the money. It, service advisors are just as much coin operated as a salesperson on the front end. Tie them in the money. You've got to make it make sense to them. If a car deal sells, get them involved. I, I relate that to the operator in the store. I've said this a couple of times. Give a dollar for every uh, time a vehicle gets sold to your central operator. It sounds not like a lot, but a couple of hundred bucks a month, I guarantee you that central operator now gets much more involved in the sales process and does a little bit better job because they have a stake in it. So put a stake in the service advisor, whatever that may be. If it's a hundred dollars fifth on every vehicle that gets sold via somebody that was working in their service lane or they up, that's a great way to start to get them involved in the process. I think it's probably a, a little much to expect them to start to get into the presentation of trading into another vehicle. But if you don't have a good CRM that alerts you when they're in, tie it into the service advisor alerting you when somebody comes in on a prime vehicle that's three to five years old, has 35,000 to 75,000 miles on it. They're still going to do the warranty work. They're still going to do the service work because eventually it's going to get back there on an RO anyway to recon the vehicle. So I think that's a couple of different ways you can tie in service advisors into that sales process. That was fantastic. Now, um, do you have any best practices on vehicle assessments or how to improve selling technician hours? Well, I would, I would definitely say on the vehicle assessments and technician hours, there's probably a couple of things. Uh, you know, my first one's always going to be 
create a service BBC. If there was one thing I was going to do inside of a dealership, I would either outsource that immediately or I would establish it inside my dealership immediately because it's the least focused area. You know, it has the smallest budget for marketing and yet it has the highest gross and retention. So many calls go into dealerships that do not get answered properly when it comes to service appointments and setting those up. Then you can incorporate database mining on top of those. Any good CRM should be able to go and identify people that hadn't been in the service in the last 90 days that are due, uh, specific op codes, uh, 30Ks, 60Ks, generate, make some outbound campaigns to those people. It's one of the easiest things that you can do and one of the highest ROIs. And you know it works. I mean, if, if somebody comes in off of a list you generated that hadn't been in in six months, I guarantee you it was because you focused on it and you reached out to them. I think the other thing people don't focus on enough in terms of selling additional service hours of the service line is decline service opportunities. So, you know, most people haven't established a process for that. There is a tremendous amount of decline service that happens on any given day where they've done a good job offering something, telling them that they have brakes coming up, telling them they have tires that are coming up, the customer's not ready, they just spent, they don't feel comfortable, look, establish a process that you're reaching back out to these consumers in the next seven days. Don't go longer than that because trust me, what ends up happening is they end up going down the street to Jiffy Lube, Pet Boys, et cetera, because they start to get worried about it. Reach out to them and offer a dollar figure off, not a percentage. Too many times I see percentages come out of the service line and say, hey, we'll get you 10% off your break job. Most consumers have no idea what a break job is going to cost. So put a dollar figure to that. Tell them it's going to be $50 off a break service or $50 off a tire, whatever that decline service was. That's another way to get some of those additional hours later on for, uh, for the service advisors and selling additional tech hours. Thank you. That was great answer. Evan, I hope you're happy with that answer. Certainly, if you have a follow-up question, you write on in and let me know. I have another great question for you, Bill, from Joe. Joe says, many times in our industry, we forget mining from our service lane. Do you have any statistics as it pertains to closing ratios from service? Well, I, you know, I've got a lot of statistics, of course, as you would expect, and I'm a firm believer um, in what Mark Twain used to say, which is uh, there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. So having said that, let me, let me, let me say the following thing. I know for a fact, regardless of what, what area of the country you're in or what city, you're looking at a 2% changeover in registrations every month. So 2% of the people that are in your city are changing registrations, in other words, selling a car and buying a car every single month. If you think about that in terms of what's going through your service lane, I mean, if you had 100 people, that's two. If you had 1,000, that's 20. I know right now that 20 of those people out of every 1,000 uh, ROs you're running through there are buying a car, changing registration. They may not be doing it at your dealership. So if you use that as a benchmark, Anything over that is a great thing to shoot for. We already know they're buying a car somewhere. And the other great part is in most dealerships, 50%, maybe a little bit less, but it's easy to say half the people that are going through your service lane right now, they bought their car somewhere else. Maybe they transitioned into your market. Maybe they bought it somewhere else because of some other thing in the past, but now they're doing business with you. It's a great way to conquest. We have a lot of dealerships right now that aren't even really big in size that have found a way to sell an additional 10 to 20 cars a month easily just by mining the service data lane and being face-to-face -face with them. But I'm going to warn you, Joe, this takes a process. This is not a plug-and-play. It does take a little bit of commitment. Back in the day, we used to send the green peas back there with some donuts and coffee and the old scripts about how, hey, look, if I could move you out of this car into something new or keep the payment same, would you be interested? The problem is we had no info. They come up front, they find that they're 10 grand buried, now we just created a heater. I think, again, as I mentioned earlier today, with the right technology, with a good partner and a CRM or other technology, you should be able to have those customers identified. You'd be able to cherry pick the ones off the top until you increase your, your process. So that was a really long answer, but I think that 2% is an easy number because they're already buying based on the number of ROs that you do. So if you've got a 1,000 ROs, there are 20 deals that are sitting in your service line any given month of any given year. That is, those are huge numbers. Wow. Joe, I hope that helps you out. And um, <laughs> Joe wrote in, 
E Leeds gives us the cherries to pick. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully. There's a lot of great companies out there. Uh, certainly, we think that we'd like to provide that as well. But really, you know, I, this is not a commercial. It hasn't been the whole time. I will tell you it's about process, guys, and, and, and that's a hard commitment. I just finished reading a book. And it talks about a survey that the College of London did. It takes 66 days to establish a habit, good or bad. This business runs on 30 days. So you've got to really change the culture to start to understand those habits. So create those processes so that you can actually execute on it, regardless of who you use. Obviously, I hope it would be us. But if not, whoever it is, maximize it. Make sure that they're a good vendor and they, they support you in those manners. Great, and this was this was a fabulous discussion right here. So, Joe, thank you so much for the great, great question. Uh, Evan uh, is back with another question for you. He says, "Hey, are we <laughs> charging for each question?" <laughs> no, we're not. He okay, says, all right. "He says at my store we have four advisors and one advisor assistant. Should we put together a BDC, or is it too much work for the advisors to handle? What's your opinion on that?" Well, you know, it, obviously, I don't have a lot of information to go on based on that. I don't know the number of ROs that they're writing on a daily basis or the number of phone calls. And I like the, the idea of, a, of a, an administrative assistant when it comes to the service advisor. So I'd be interested to know what that particular role is. But without knowing that information, here's the answer that I would give, and it goes back to my multitasking rule, which is it's a lie. There's no such thing. Somebody can't do a lot of different things well. They do a lot of different things average. Keep them centered on what they do best. A service advisor self is in the lane, is talking to those consumers, and doing that face-to-face. -face. That's what they do best. Set up a separate BDC. It doesn't take a lot of people. You can do it internally there. You would find an amazing uplift in the amount of opportunities that you create just from a service standpoint. Um, so my recommendation would be, Find a way to build a BDC or, or obviously outlay that to a virtual BDC company that can help you with that at a low cost. Because I think the overall amount of gross that goes to a bottom line from every single one of those ROs will more than justify it. I'd further say if I only had the opportunity to build one BDC, whether it be for sales or whether it be for service, the first one I'd build would be for service because that's going to bottom line uh, matriculate faster than anywhere else because we know what those equivalent to the profit centers versus what the sale of a car does. It just doesn't feel as fun, right? Everybody likes to do car sales because we get plaques on it, but really service is the backbone. So long answer, Evan. Thank you for the question. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of direction. Thank you so much, Evan. Great questions. He's got another one coming up, too. But before we get to his other question, I want to get to Danny over here. Danny says, I've been hired as the initial employee starting up a BDC. And this webinar highlighted so many great ideas. Where's the best place for a single person BDC to start to be able to build up? Just for background, we are an 18 salesperson store, of which four are internet with two service advisors. I know there's a lot okay. of information, Bill. What do you got? <laughs> well, I, you know, look, you, you go after, uh, first determine what is the one thing. And, and what I mean by that, Danny, is what is the one thing that is most important that is going to have the biggest impact from your BDC standpoint and what you're going to do. If you identify that one thing, you're all set from there. And it, it's, what I mean by that is, where is the biggest opportunity in the store? Where are those goals at? You know, we were just talking about Evan and his questions on service. Is it in the service lane or is it in the sales opportunity? First determine that because you're not going to be able to do both. Um, number two, once you identify what that one thing is, you've got to put all your effort and concentrate on that and then next determine what is the one thing that you can actually maximize in that. Is it inbound or is it outbound? And that's a critical because you're not going to be able to do both again. So those are the kind of steps that I would go along and try to identify um, because you really have to be centric and you really have to be specific on where it's going to be at that point. If you ask me what my one thing would be with not being in your store, database mining, start there, be a 
business development center from that standpoint. You get a lot of wins from several different areas. Number one, we already talked about the percentages and what you can identify those customers, and they're untapped. Number two, you can generate business right now, which means when you generate business inside of a BDC, you become more valuable, that you can attend actual car deals to, and you're able to grow that department, and then your success will allow you to choose what the next one thing is. So that would be my answer. Start with the business development from the standpoint of database marketing, but that's me. I would identify a couple of those one other things first uh, before you get to that level. Now, in, in extension to Danny's question, when you say identify those best opportunities, are you saying the most profitable opportunities, or are you saying like low-hanging fruit that just haven't been picked yet? Yeah, you know, look, you can't determine what profitable is until the deal is done, and even then it can get into accounting and change. So, you know, I, I would tell you that it's the most likely to buy is what I look at as the most largest opportunity. I mean, look, at the end of the day, if I can generate five deals today and two of them are a couple hundred bucks and two of them are several hundred dollars, I'll take all of them because I think there are opportunities that weren't there before. So I go after the people that are most likely to buy. Again, in that database marketing, let me look for that sweet spot. People that are in that equity position, um, you know, they have, they've had the car more than a year or two, so you know, they're, they're ready to get out. Don't try to go after the people that have a year left in a 60-month deal. That's, stay away from that. They're already owners in their mind. They can see the end of the pathway. So maybe it's that 24 to 48-month owner um, in a loan that has equity. Those are the kind of prospects I think are low-hanging fruit, and eventually they become more profitable because, look, they're cold calls. They're not out shopping you. They don't have five or six different quotes. They hadn't even thought about getting a new car until you bring this to them. And don't get discouraged just because they don't say yes immediately. Sometimes what happens is after you've made that call and you said, hey, if I could move you into something new or maintenance-free without it costing you a lot of money, they say no, and then three or four days later, they start to think about it. It's like a little time bomb that goes off, and they go, wow, boy, it would be nice to have a new car. And they'll follow back up with you. So that would be my answer to that, Ileana. Great follow-up. <laughs> Danny, great question. And I'm going to give you one last question, which comes to us from our friend Evan. And his question is, what's the best way to tell or ask a client about a survey without coaching them for a perfect score? Now, Evan's question is, is valid in and of itself, but then my next question would be, what's wrong with coaching somebody for a perfect score? Bill? <laughs> right, sure. I mean, you know, obviously this is along the lines of a survey from the standpoint of CSI, whether it be for service or whether it be for sales, and, and typically that comes down from the mandates of manufacturers and how they want to, you know, look at that and gauge that. And what's interesting is, you know, CSI only becomes uh, big again uh, when we start selling a lot of cars. So you know the business is getting better. A few years ago, I assure you, nobody was really worried about CSI from a manufacturer standpoint. They were worrying about selling cars. So that's a positive thing. Now, to answer the question, I would say this. Um, first, Ileana, it's not bad to coach. It's just unfortunate the manufacturers don't want you to coach. So you have to walk a very fine line there. But look, I look at it in a different way, and this is not the easy way. So, uh, you know, the hard way is sometimes the best way. And the hard way is, I said earlier, get the feedback. Find out what the real feedback is, and then you can change the processes that are inside the store or what's happening. That goes a lot further than trying to coach somebody through a good CSI. You're not really getting good feedback. I mean, what you really want is you want to know what the problem is. If you don't know what the problem is, you can't correct it. Maybe you identify that there's a specific service advisor that's not doing something in the process consistently. If you know that, you can go to that. A service advisor and you can coach and counsel and change it. Then you don't have to worry about coaching. It inherently corrects the problem. But if you never know what that problem is, nothing happens. My last piece of, of, of I guess, consideration on that is when you do find out what the issues are or when you do get that feedback, address it. That's the biggest problem that happens, I think, or challenges that happen inside dealerships. Sometimes we get the feedback, we promise them that we're going to do something about it, and then we drop the ball and we don't do anything. So not just find the feedback out, but then go execute on it and follow up. So that would be my advice. It's really no good way to necessarily coach somebody. I mean, you can certainly do it. Um, you can't make them feel guilty. They don't care. Trust me, I've heard that deal before. You can't give away free stuff. All that does is cost you money. My advice is 
find out what the real issue is, get the real feedback, and then execute on it so that you don't have to worry about coaching or service CSI or sales CSI. You've eliminated the issue. Bill, you were absolutely wonderful today. And audience, well, fantastic you. questions from the audience. This was an absolutely great webinar. And Bill, I think, I think it's safe to say, come on. You can do another one with me, right? No, I don't know. I, mean, I know. It took some. Five, my hair might be five times as longer by the next time compared to the picture that's on there. I yeah. think you need a new picture too, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> but you did such a great job. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. I love when I come to a webinar and I learn stuff too. So this is really, really great. I really appreciate it. It was wonderful. Well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, number one. And thank you to Dealer On, of course, as a, as a great company out there. We really appreciate all their support. But most importantly to, uh, to all the people that attend today, as I said earlier, it's an investment of your time. I really appreciate that. Um, that costs you a lot. You can't get time back. So make sure that you use it wisely. And, and I really appreciate you using your time today with us. You're very kind, Bill. Thank you so much. People are already writing in and saying what a great job you did. Now, of course, I want to remind you. I want to remind the audience, if you have a follow-up question for Bill, his contact information is right there. Please feel free to contact him. As you can see, he's a super nice guy. And yeah. he, <laughs> he is, I swear. <laughs> any answers that weren't, uh, any questions that weren't answered during the time allotted, well, we'll answer them by email later today. I want to remind the audience that a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. Hey, feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. This was awesome. And today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. So go to dealeron.com slash webinars and click on the link on the right-hand side for on-demand webinars. And you can access this webinar as well as any of our past webinars. You can also view and register for any of our upcoming webinars, too. Hey. This webinar is going to close up in just a moment, and you're going to receive a short survey, so please fill it out, because we're always looking for great feedback from you, our valued audience. And today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from our completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. So please fill out that survey, because I really want you to tell Bill what a great job he did. I also want to let you know that Dealeron is going to be at the upcoming Digital Dealer Convention in Las Vegas next week. It's October 15th, 16th, and 17th at the Mirage. We're going to be at booth 809. I'm going to be there because guess what? Along with these amazing presenters we have during this year's Digital Dealer Convention, we're going to do a live webinar from the booth at Digital Dealer from the exhibit hall floor. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be with Grant Cardone, and he's going to be talking about the more formula. I'm going to tell you about that in a second, but if you're going to be in Vegas, I need you to come to the booth Wednesday, October 16th at 1 o'clock Vegas time, but that's also 4 o'clock Eastern time. We are going to be broadcasting live, and I know I always tell you that our webinars are on Thursdays, but next week it's going to be on Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Live broadcast. It's going to be awesome, and like I said, it's you have to be there. You have to be there. We're going to be giving away some great prizes. And not to be outdone, our friends at Elite One will also be at Digital Dealer. They, you got, got to stop by their booth and meet Bill in person. He's super, super sweet. The booth number is 610. And if you stop by the booth, you got a chance to win an iPad Mini. So more than a couple of reasons to go and stop by Elite One, uh, along with the fact that they are just an amazing company with a really super product. So hopefully we'll get to see you there. And like I said earlier, invitations are going to be going out tomorrow for our next webinar, The More Formula with Grant Cardone. More, the same, or less. Whether you know it or not, you make this decision every day with everything you do. And Grant Cardone has The More Formula. And he's going to tell you what it is and how to use it in this exciting presentation from the exhibit hall of the Digital Dealer Convention. Grant Cardone is going to talk about what you have to do to get more out of your career, your department, your income, your life. This presentation will cover why more is vital to your success and the health of your business and how you can apply a simple formula to help you get more in all areas of your life. So if you think you are ready to finally get more for yourself, more for your business, and more out of life, then it goes without saying that this presentation is an event you simply can't miss. It's going to be another fabulous presentation by your friends at DealerOn. 
Don't forget, our weekly webinars are usually held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. But since we're hosting this webinar with Grant Cardone live from the Dealer on Booth at the DDC Exhibit Hall, it'll be on Wednesday, October 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. So please put it in your calendar. And we have some really great webinar subjects planned for this year. But if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, hey, contact me directly. I love hearing from you. My name is Eliana Raggio. You can track me down online. I'm on all the automotive social networks, Twitter, Facebook, and all of them. All of them. I'm everywhere. Or you can email me directly at Eliana at DealerOn.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today. And I hope to see you all on a future webinar in our continuing education series. Have yourselves a good one.